Okay, well, it's, uh, it's late already, it's half past five, so um, <coughs> I think we continue with the next bit of, uh, of discussion. Um, like this morning, uh, I think it's a good idea to start with the more, the, sort of the more technical questions that are uh, addressed at the speaker so specifically, and that we then discuss, briefly discuss uh, some of the broader issues that uh, arise when we discuss uh, um, <coughs> Uh, non-new genetic uh, systems. Uh, I would like to point out that actually tomorrow m morning there will be also uh, there will be more talks on uh, on related issues. So we can uh, we don't have to finish this, this discussion tonight. So does anyone have a, 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 a more technical question for one of the speakers uh, this afternoon? Of course, we would like to know more about this transcription, uh, unnatural transcription. So uh, that was a teaser that you, okay, so can you tell us more, <coughs> Floyd, about uh, uh, so, what um, kind of, uh, of uh, molecules have you, have you inserted in? Uh, so, um, we've trans uh, transcribed um, GFP, SuperVol GFP, mm -hmm. three different codons mm -hmm. to look at early, middle, late, and we are only now beginning to look at sequence biases, so we haven't heavily done that yet. Um, we 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 um, just got our own LCM SMS, so we're setting up to do rigorous fidelity assays because I mean NAB has been great, but we just can't send we can't use them in a developmental fashion because it turns out they have other things to do. Um, but so so right now everything is based on the buy it and shift, and it's not a very quantitative measure, so we don't really care about that yet, except looking for differences. What I can tell you, and I, I alluded to this, I think, um, is that tRNAs transcribe better. And we attribute that. Um, usually T7 RNAP uh, is resistant to row, determinant, term, row termination because it's fast, but we suspect that maybe running across transcription of our guy is, slows it down a little bit, and so structure prevents row determination. So, um, I alluded to this to you as well. Um, I'm giving. I'm, I hope none of you are reviewers on my paper because you'll be bored. Um, we, we've worked hard to get E. coli RNAP work, and it doesn't. But there are anti-termination systems which we can deploy, which turn it on. Um, so that's. Okay. <laughs> uh, so you had a transporter to bring in here. Um, oh, that's what my phosphates. Yeah, what you would want to call. Them. Uh, and you said that you mutated it to reduce the toxicity. Do you know how that mutation worked? I'm a transporter person, so I'd really like to know. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell me? <laughs> We're publishing that. <laughs> I, so I, I apologize, I can't, because this um, some of this work is funded by a small biotech company, and they get hypersensitive to things like that. The camera. Of course. <laughs> Um, uh, so two questions. First one is you didn't say whether the cells turned green, and the second one is uh, what happens when you put consecutive uh, unnatural bases in um, the template? So they didn't turn green because we're in, in no case have we transcribed both a tRNA and an mRNA. But what I will tell you in getting to that, um, we've isolated mRNA and um, the majority of its full length, but, but of course, unlike, unlike replication, you get um, some that, that, that are abortive early. And so we get some that do abort at the unnatural base pair. And what's really interesting is uh, they don't abort there. They abort 11 nucleotides past, reproducibly. And that's a footprint of a ribosome. And other people have already shown that. And we've gone in with specific nucleases to digest them and use a certain pattern. And it is certainly that. And so all I can tell you is that the RNA is spewing out of out of T7, and the ribosomes are recognizing it, and they're stalling. Yeah. yeah. And so the hope is that once we do it together. Um, the second question, of, uh, so we have PCR amplified uh, contiguous uh, unnatural base pairs. Um, it's certainly more difficult, and I, 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 like to, I like to be clear about this. Um, we are not creating an orthogonal system. Our base pairs require the context of a natural system. Uh, we, I don't. Even, we've never even tried, and I don't think they would even form duplexes if they were all our hydrophobic analogs. Um, having said that, uh, we will create more codons than could ever be used if we never put them anywhere near each other, um, and that's the goal. 
if not in any way to imitate nature <coughs> and to make our analogs as good as GC and AT, um, it's simply to get to the spot where you can stably store and retrieve and evolve increased information. That's the question up there. It's a, again for Floyd, it's a, of anyone actually, but it's a technical comment. Um, so one of the beauties of our natural systems is that they've evolved a lot of very sophisticated DNA repair systems, including base excision repair, which deals with you know spontaneous deamination of cytosine, uracil, uh, you know spontaneous loss of base where you end up with apurinic, apurinic sites, etc., etc. Plus all the redox perturbations on the DNA itself, and, and uh, all sorts of other uh, chemical uh, damage that occurs. So I mean, all the natural systems are highly evolved to deal with that, and obviously keep the you know keep the code completely faithful and repl replicable between subsequent generations. So how is the synthetic base going to cope? with normal chemical, you know, perturbations and how will the natural system deal with that? Uh, for example, if you have a synthetic base next to, say, a, a uracil that becomes, uh, a cytosine that becomes uh, deaminated and the uracil is removed and you end up with an AP site, and you, is there, I mean, do you have any information on how that might work or have you already done that? I don't know. So I'll take a pass at it and then there you go. I'll take a pass and then I'll answer first and then. So, um, from, from our perspective, um, the, 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 the unnatural base pair itself um, appears not to be generally recognized by damage repair pathways, M MMR, uh, BER, NER. Um, what, what we think, and so none of this is published yet, but we've, we've now looked at a whole bunch of different sequence contexts, and some of them are better replicated than others. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that for the, the worst replicated sequences, um, SOS plays a role, and if you make a Lexa uninducible strain, fidelities go up. Uh, so we think, and, and that makes sense because all of the other pathways involve recognition of the nucleobase, and presumably they just can't rec. So they're probably undergoing fetal cycles. They're probably re maybe recognizing a, a distorted duplex or something, and but they just can't do anything about it. SOS first is different because it's damage specific independent, damage type independent. Um, this, the, 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 the more subtle question about um, damage proximal where the same thing is, uh, then happens by, and you prevent repair in a proximal manner. Um, sure, but you got to remember that all of those strains are viable at least for reasonably long periods of time because that sort of mutation, they just don't accrue enough. Um, certainly on the time scale of a protein expression or even frankly a long-term evolution experiment mm -hmm. as we run them, we just wouldn't expect that to be a problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You know, our goal is, is Nixon is going to um, to Nixon to the plasmid system. Um, where Nixon is, is producing enzymes, is producing Nixon enzymes also, uh, which is in fact a completely isolated system, where I don't think repair should be a question. We don't need that, I think. Okay. <coughs> I have a very short question also about uh, the orthogonality thing. Um, so <clears throat> you showed that uh, the DNA and RNA may have these uh, spiral structures, but uh, if you change the backbone, you get, you get these ribbon-like things. What are you, do you think this really can be worked into a feasible information carrying system? There's pr pr presumably reasons for DNA to have this, this particular spiral form. But the, the burden is indeed and by the polymerase, it should be replicated that. And of course, the helical structure is shorter, uh, and it's more. It's, it's also more folded than a straightforward structure. So it's certainly again not a system which you will be able to use in a chromosome or in, in, in a com completely replace the, in the organism. Again, it should be restricted to something where it is applicable, <coughs> and you cannot go. And as far as I, I think, you cannot go much further as a plasma. But that's also. The, the reason. Yeah, but I would like perhaps to comment on this. It might be that, uh, yes, the double helix is so emblematic of biology and so on, but when you look at the choreography of DNA in the cells, you see that there is an awful lot of proteins, energy expenditure, and so on, to unfold it. So it might be that uh, backbones that are prone not to make helices, but that would, uh, in an induced fit like uh, Floyd told us, be able to replicate nevertheless might lead to replicants that would be f uh, much, much more easy to, to, to manage and evolve at least ex vivo. So it might not be a, uh, an inconvenience after all not to have 
proper folding in a regular <coughs> basis. Okay. Let's say that with, with changing the backbone, you have a whole generation of possible stretches. So it might be that, yes, it might be that but template. I'm sorry, yes. go ahead. And you, have, you, have, you have a whole choice of possible structures. This xylo is just, is just, is just one example. What, you have to see what has to be processed, what has to be done, what, what is the task of this changed, uh, changed, uh, uh, topologically changed or geometrically Yes, changed. again, it's again it's a question. Um, if, if, you, if you use it in certain, for certain functions, I think it should be used in itself for certain functions. What, and then, can, can you be more specific? I would like to know. It's a different functionality, but what do you think of? What is your dream? What to do? But the dream is, is to find the dream <coughs> is to, um, to to encode in this in this artificial nucleic acids um, for reactions from which then the whole cell becomes dependent. To 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 put a, a headquarters in the cell to control the cellular functions. To catalyze some cellular functions in, in that system, and that the whole cell is dependent on catalytic, catalytic functions, you put in this but artificial. But why is this structure better than the? Uh, it's it's not better. It's, it's it's about orthogonality. If you if you have a helical structure, if you have something with a helical structure yeah, like DNA, you produce it in a cell. It will recognize DNA RNA and block the nature of functions. That's the problem. It's like, uh, there are several reasons for that. You could think of non-Euclidean biology, right? So you, you something like that, you know, try to uh, implement systems that have not occurred spontaneously and that are not in the uh, axioms of uh, molecular biology. Just for the sake of it, it is scientifically interesting to do it. Now, on, there is another answer to your question, sir, which is that when you say, what are, uh, how are the natural specifications respected by this unnatural stuff and so on, frankly, the, the notions that we have of natural design and natural specification is very short. So making artificial systems and interrogating natural systems with such systems as Floyd, X and so on is a way of understanding. So synthetic biology is not only a way of constructing a tower of Babel and so on, it's also a matter, a way of understanding life as we know it. Well, <laughs> yes, I, I, I would like to have it more precise because something has to be optimized and if it's a better shape or better structure then I understand maybe autogonality, chemical organality might be a profit. There's this among my fellow evolutionary biologists, there's a lot of discussion going on about whether evolution is optimizing something and if it's if it does what is it of what is it optimizing? So it's not always so obvious. That's not obvious, I agree totally. So but if, if it's still a question about I think I think it's very funny that you can create this rhythm like DNA structure like things, but um, and the question to me is, well, why has nature not already experimented with this uh, before? And why not this? this okay. But then you already claimed that it somehow has tried to do that, <laughs> but it didn't take it because it was not successful. Either. Now, it's behind your argument. So. Uh, a question: uh, Is there any uh, any? Um, plan to, to try to, <coughs> to put uh, Ishiro's and uh, your basis in the same organism. <laughs> I think it should be attempted. I, I think not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the way I think of it, and Achiro can um, comment, comment, we've actually talked about this, um, this it, 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 I guess I, I, don't, I don't think they would, that ours and Achiro's would work together, because I think that um, uh, I mean, we've looked at lots of mispairing, and we occasionally, in the process, we actually, in, in evaluating um, un candidate unnatural base pairs, we of course evaluated what, in the end, uh, would amounted to mispairs between our analog and other hydrophobics. Um, water excludes water really well. It doesn't, oil, oil excludes water really well. Oil doesn't exclude oil all that well. Uh, Do they recognize each other? Do you? Basis or recognized by his base, so we have a four base pair systems together. I don't think they would be orthogonal. I think that. No, 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 no. Yeah. I, so I think that they would probably go on at some intermediate level against each other. But it was to Ah, maybe, maybe. 
they're each commercially available, so we could have, we, we each of us could have bought the other guys, so obviously there's... <laughs> there's a question. Yeah, I had a question. Um, I mean, we've heard from George, George trying to pack as much information as possible in, in DNA, to use it as a, like, a long-term storage of computerized information. And then the unnatural basis that you're incorporating would, I, I guess, enhance stability, certainly against biological degradation. Would they also enhance stability against physical chemical degradation? In other words, would these be better formats to store information, like for eternity, if you would? I think they would be better, because as well as well the uh, the systems. Uh, which, which Freud is using with this modified base as putting an, an artificial backbone where you don't have a glycosidic bond anymore. They are terminally much more stable on DNA. So DNA is one of the most unstable uh, oligonucleotides you can have once you change the, once you change the bases. Yeah? Because he cannot have uh, any protonation anymore on the DNA base because they have no nitrogen analog anymore. So they are intrinsically chemically more stable. HNA backbone, xylonucleic acid is much more, is much, much more stable. So uh, your answer is yes. If you want to store information, better do it with, with XNA or with modified bases. And the worst you could take is DNA. <laughs> but isn't, isn't the question that, that DNA needs to be, in the evolution context, doesn't DNA need to be mutated and changed and altered? So isn't it the fact that the instability of DNA is inherently part of the evolutionary process? Mm. Well, I think it's a metabolic issue. Yes. I mean, I'm just laying it out there. <laughs> well, that's, that's why you have, why, why you have uracil bases instead of thymine bases in RNA, because people claim that RNA becomes DNA, and RNA makes, and uracil makes more mistakes as, 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 thymine, as, as DNA. So there is much more evolutionary power in RNA and DNA, which is base, which is base dependent. There is. Of course, this, this plays a game. Uh, well, I think that people have argued about this for a long time, and I think the one argument is that it just was, um, it exceeded the sort of uh, cost ratio benefit um, to, to optimize to the point that it optimized, because they probably could have optimized further. Right. Um, but I, I think like the, abil the, the, evolution, the, the ability to evolve, the evolution of evolvability is a pretty cantankerous subject, and um, that evolutionary biologists get all wound up about. Um, and so, I, but but I, I think that um, uh, I, as a result, it certainly drives evolution, and it's hard to imagine how it could happen without. It is a, it's a topic which I which I sort of emerged in my mind when I was listening to all these talks about the ge changing the genetic code. So it's my colleagues who are doing a research on evolution. They have now these machines. You can put the animals in them, and you get the code. So you get, uh, you get these machines and you put a, a bit of the animal in it and it, it reads the code for you and it's, it's, it produces the genetic code. But actually it turns out that it's become very clear that in many cases this code is not sufficient. And not all of the information that in, in individuals use to create their phenotypes is encoded in DNA. And so sort of the, the field of epigenetics is now a, a big thing. And uh, so I was wondering to what extent it has been known whether these alternative bases are also prone to things like uh, methylation and uh, that sort of thing, to what extent they can, uh, can be modified this way. Some of them will over the world. So, depending on the base you use. <laughs> but in, in, in natural systems, there's a whole sort of uh, well, enzyme system that is doing well, this. Well, enzyme systems are, are quite for base, if you see, if you do some small modifications, <coughs> you put a simple halogen on a pyramine, a pyramine or, pyrimidine, or you, you remove a nitrogen and put a carbon atom, they are not anymore recognized by restriction enzymes at all. Yeah? And they are very small modifications. Yeah? So I think it's, it's going to be very methylation, very similar. It's going to be difficult. So I, I would give you for our from our perspective, sort of two reasons that I don't suspect that is coming on, around the, the, the corner. And one is um, they're inherently less functional because they have less reactive functionality in them. You can look at the natural purines and pyrimidines and you see reactive centers. Um, and secondly, uh, you know, evolution works by tinkering or acceptation or whatever you want to call it. You really have to have something that's close to start from. And there really shouldn't be much in a cell that recognizes the analogs. So they're pretty far off. So the idea that 
you know, that a small number mutation or that lateral gene transfer could, you know, sweep in some new activity. It's probably, it, I would guess, is unlikely. But if you make epigenetics, do we have to switch genes on and off from the other uh, I think there's plenty for us to do before we worry about that. Well, also, we, we shouldn't forget that there, there is a lot of epigenetic information also in the relations between proteins, how they make for switch or whatever. There is a lot of information that this is, this is still available. What would not be available is the type of information by analogy that is uh, contained in the fact that uh, this cytosine is methylated, that this histone is acetylated. Yeah. I think it's actually more likely that our analogs themselves would act as sort of epigenetic switches by altering histone packing or um, unwinding during transcription or lots of things like that. <coughs> if you go to artificial system, I think you, sh you should always go to the more simple system. And it's, it's per part unfair to complete it with a completely evolved system and expecting that you would need the same functionalities for, for, for life and survival. Yeah, so if, if, if the goal is to have like artificial amino acids in your protein sequence or an orthogonal system, could you both comment on the alternative approach with the full codon base pairs from Jason Chin, for instance, how, how that kind of is complementary or competition, or, yeah. Yeah, so I know Jason well. Um, you, you know, there's, t to me, I, I'm a, a, a interest. I mean, it's an interesting approach because there's no, um, uh, I mean, ribosome production is tightly coupled to cell growth. Um, it, it's really hard to imagine a robust, healthy cell expressing an orto or completely orthogonal set of ribosomes that uh, have, you know, altered ribosome binding sites to recognize the four base pair codon. Nonetheless, it's certainly a creative idea. People had been working with four codons for a while, um, and of course, you get suppression effects as a three codon, as you'd expect. Um, in this case, they're not RF mediated; they're just the natural anti-codon mediated. Um, and and sir, so one, I mean, so people often talk about you know combining this with sort of a, a Schultz. Um, and then maybe a you know, resynthesized genome that's been that's had more drastic uh, reappropriation done, um, but that's we look at that as is you know really elegant and really hard approaches to getting at most two unnatural base pairs in, um, and then amino acids. Sorry, amino acids. Yeah, um, and that all might work and it's really interesting, but uh, we we think that perfectly interesting sort of different approach is just to rewire it up from the bottom and have to not worry about suppression as a three base pair codon if you're trying to read it in a four code um, or to have more than amber. Um, you, so there's all sorts of issues about trying, I mean people, George Church um, tried to synthesize essentials and I mean there's really interesting growth effects there because it turns out that essentials are enriched, they're GC biased, right, and they're enriched in the beginning of genes and they affect structure and you can't delete them. So the, the, it, our, our perspective is the code and codon usage as part of the code is, is, is extremely, is pleiotropically entangled with lots of other aspects of the cell. And it's just, I would argue, an interesting different approach to try to rewire it up from the bottom where you avoid those pleiotropic conflicts. Regarding the, the quadruplet coding and so on, there is also a, uh, it has to be uh, uh, recognize that what has been proven so far is translation of a quadruplet between triplets you know I don't think that there is a demonstration that several quadruplets can be correctly translated and that the frame sh the frame has been uh, and as Floyd said re-engineering the, the ribosome so as to make uh, multiplet coding and so on would require <coughs> an amount of work that is n that is really daunting That's the question in the back. Yeah. I, I was wondering, you know, if you could, if you could have like ten different amino acids in a in a protein, ten ten new ones. I was just wondering about. Could you give a hint of the kind of applications we might want to do that? Well, what could we do with ten new amino acids that we couldn't do like with two or three right now? I mean, like real applications. So, um, ten new unnatural amino acids, as opposed to two or three unnatural new. Well, so first of all. The options we have right now is one, yeah, and they're and it's not efficient. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there's an immense amount of optimization required. Um, and remember the whole notion of delete, of trying to repro, uh, of, tr of trying to recode and maybe delete RF1. That will never work outside of bacteria, right? Eukaryotes have one RF. That's it. There's there's not you don't have the trick to play there. So, uh, so the, the notion and, and from a from a pharmaceutical perspective, uh, the reason all the unnatural base pairs are put at the beginning is because if you get truncation, it's not as much of a separation problem. But if if, if you if you can't do that, game over because you can't. Separate on. I mean, farm is not going to run columns. Sure. So, I would argue there's justification for a single. Now, for two, there's all sorts of other issues. For example, in sort of simplest thing, if you go to farm and you ask, well, what are the two things they're interested? They're interested in ADCs, and they're interested in antibody drug conjugates, and they're interested in, um, well, pegylation or prenylation or, or right PK issues. So, right from the start, we could give that. We the hope is that we could do both. Um, that's a pretty easy argument to make. Everything else when you start to get... But right now, people can't do two. Getting to three, you start to get some, to some more esoteric things like, well, that plus a metal binding site or something that facilitates purification. Or... Um, but ten, I... I, I, I uh, okay, four or five. Maybe I put in those three plus seven additional colors by different GFPs just because it would be fun to see color. I don't, I don't <laughs> That two might be okay, but I think there should be. There might be ten different, but but not ten at the same time. You could have a cassette of two and always two different, because the problem with a lot of enzymes is that the the number of the reactions they can catalyze is limited. So you cannot catalyze these all the reactions. You cannot catalyze a lot of reactions, which is due in organic chemistry, which is not which is not uh, which you cannot use in biotechnology. And there's going to be an, an, uh, there's certainly a demand for new proteins that can catalyze different reactions for making chemicals, for making drugs. So I think there is certainly a need for more than two, but for, for generating new catalytic functions, you might only need, need two. But another cassette of two, another cassette of two, dependent on the reaction you want to catalyze. <laughs> So to, to continue in this directory, I think after we should uh, we should uh, stop on this one. <coughs> actually, tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning we are actually going to continue on this because actually I I am a bit skeptical to what extent we actually can design the next step. I think if you it would be a big thing if you could make an alternative genetic system, but then you would have you would need to have it evolve uh, to work to, to weed out all the all the. All the <coughs> All the all the, the mistakes that it, it will make, so right? uh, <coughs> But uh, so um, but this is uh, this is something which I, I suspect will come up uh, to, tomorrow also in, uh, in one of the talks. There was one question in the back, Philippe? Oh, I just wanted to comment on that question that there's two companies, Pepti Dream and Ralph Pharmaceuticals, which use a whole spectrum of unnatural amino acids in peptide discovery, but in an in vitro transcription translation system. So if you if you can chemically charge or enzymatically charge your tRNAs with whatever you want, you can reassign the codons again, whichever way you like. And because it's in vitro, you don't have to worry about you know, poisoning the rest of the cell. So in that case, um, certainly for peptides, circular peptides specifically, you know, D-amino acids are obviously advantageous and so on and so on. So I think there's no shortage of cool things one could do in vivo once the code has been expanded. Okay, I thank you. As I propose that we will continue with this discussion tomorrow morning, and I'd like to thank both speakers this afternoon.